it's really good to have uh, Michael North um, with with us today, and uh, we're going to be interviewing Michael. So it's good to have you with us, Michael. Happy to be with you. Do you prefer to be called Michael or Mike or something else? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, Mike often. I'm known more as Mike than Michael. Okay. Well, that's good. Yeah, I, I normally only get my full name when I'm in trouble. So it's, it's normally yeah. Tony, but Anthony when I'm in trouble. So, Mike, it's great to have uh, you with us today. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself, Michael? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm from Bradford. I was born there, born there on the 3rd of January 1939. Um, and I lived there until I was um, nine years old. And then I, at that time, won a choristership to Magdalen College Choir in Oxford. Oh wow! And so I went to I went to uh, to become a chorister there. Um, I was a chorister until about fourteen, when my voice broke, and then um, I carried on at uh, Magdalen College School until I was eighteen. There, so I lived about nine years nine years in Oxford. Got to know it pretty well. Came back uh, to um, Bradford, got a job as a, an industrial chemist, um, a metallurgist at um, a firm called Lowmore Alloy Steel, oh, and yeah. then um, stayed there a couple of years. And then I um, went to another uh, firm um, and uh, was uh, involved in. Uh, what were called selective hormone weed killers mm -hmm. and doing chemical analysis uh, to, um, to make those more effective. Mm -hmm. um, however, when I was at school, I was kind of equally good at art and science. And so I continued while I was a chemist and making pictures up in the attic at home, which was my bedroom. And um, one day I was looking in the... Uh, Telegraph and Argus, and uh, saw the uh, a little advert from the art college inviting people to come down and look at an exhibition of work from the different departments, like the fine art department, the textile department, etc., ceramics, and uh, so I went down, and um, I just said to the head of fine art that I was still making pictures and. I'd be interested in joining the course. So he said, well, if you come in and show me what, 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 what you've been doing, um, I'll give you a kind of response. And so I did. And he said, well, you can join the course. So I joined, joined the course and I was on, on the old National Diploma of Design course for four, four years at Bradford. And then I went- How old were you at that point, Mike? Sorry? How old were you at that point? At this point, I was um, 21. Right, okay. 21, 22. And I um, then, um, went after that, went to Leeds um, University Department of Education to do my teacher training course for a year. And then I got a job at um, Wolverhampton College of Art. Um, teaching fine art and setting up a printmaking department in the, in the painting school. Um, and then I left and went to um, Loughborough, mm -hmm. to Loughborough um, College of Art at that time for a, a job again, teaching, teaching fine art. So that's how I got to Loughborough and that was in uh, January of 1969. Right. Well, let's jump. Let's jump back a little bit, um, Mike. So, in terms of your family being brought up in, in Bradford, um, a big family, small family, small family. I've just a sister. I've just got a sister, really. And then there were um, brothers and aunts, you know. Um, but um, it was relatively small family. And obviously, you mentioned sort of getting involved with with choristers and stuff. We, I mean, were your family sort of churchgoers? Uh, not really, not really. They they were kind of nominal Christians, really. They call themselves, you know, church for for 
you know, wedding deaths and births. Yeah, yeah. And that was about it. Or Christmas, yeah. perhaps Christmas. You know, and that was about it. Although my father, when he was younger, he had been a regular churchgoer, and I've still got his Bible, actually, that was presented right. to him when he was, I suppose, in his teens. Yeah. But that seemed to have um, fallen away as, a, as an interest and activity as far as he was concerned. And my mother was never really religious. So no, I wasn't brought up in a, a, what you call Christian family. What about yourself, though? Would you, would you say you had a belief in God when you were young or you didn't really think about him? Um, well, in, in, in a way, yes. In a, in, in a way, when, I mean, when I was in the choir in Oxford, obviously we were, we were singing a lot of uh, hymns and anthems based on the scriptures. But I didn't actually take much notice of those, really. Okay. Um, uh, you know, I like the music. I didn't really listen to the words. Yeah. And when we were, when, <laughs> when they were reading the first and second lessons from the Bible in the, uh, in the services, you know, um, I and others were playing noughts and crosses. Mm. You know, anybody remember noughts and crosses? <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I wasn't listening to, to, to all this, this kind of, uh, um, canopy of um, you know scriptural information that was uh, over me all this time for the four years four or five years I was in the choir before so my few... voice broke but when I started to teach in Wolverhampton I got more interested in eastern religions mm. um, as was popular in the in, in the 60s you know with the Beatles and others and um, I had a, a colleague there who was an Indian and uh, he was into kind of tantric philosophy and active practice and he got me interested in Eastern religions but I came to the conclusion that um, it didn't really matter which road you were on as long as you were on one particular road to God you'd be okay and so if you're a Buddhist you'd be okay if you were uh, 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 Islamic, you'd be okay. If you were Christian, you know, in, believing in Jesus, you'd be okay. Yeah. And I just felt that there were certain major kind of prophets for different cultures. Okay. And they were the kind of, mainly the gateways for those cultures to God. And so, you know, all... Well, all rivers lead to the same ocean, as it were. That well, there's was many, the kind of belief I had. Yeah, well, I mean, there's many would would still believe that today, of course, isn't there? That there's there's, there's just sort yeah. of um, many paths to to the mountain top to God ultimately. But what about you then? So obviously, you're thinking um, all these different paths lead somewhere. But w where were you in terms of the paths then, and how did you get on a path? Or well, how I got on a path was that when I got to Loughborough, um, I um, was living in a house next to a woman who was a Jehovah's Witness. And one day we were talking about, um, talking about some aspects of scripture and belief. And I think it, during the conversation, John 14, 6 came up. You know, Jesus saying, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, that was rather a kind of um, revolutionary statement as far as I was concerned and where I was at that time. Many rivers lead to the same ocean. Mm. And I thought, goodness me, I'll have to find about, out about this, this, this man, you know, who's saying that he is the actually only way. You know, he's throwing every other... Um, cultural belief out of the window and um, so the lady next door um, she asked me if I'd like to have what uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses call Bible study with mm -hmm. one of the elders in the local congregation which was quite close to where I lived and I said okay and so I started studying do you remember this Yes, I, I do remember that book, yeah. So what year would that have been, Mike? 
this would be nine, about 1972. Right, okay. Yeah, this was, a, it was first printed in 1968, this book. Yeah. And uh, so, um, but I didn't realise at the time, of course, that this was the um, JW interpretation mm. of the scriptures. Mm. Yeah. You know, I really did th kind of think, well, it is the truth that leads to eternal life. Yeah, sure. And so, basically, um, I, I, I just did a, a fairly standard kind of uh, JW study. And um, I got eventually uh, baptised in 1974. Right, okay. Interesting time to get baptised. Believing that I had the truth, yeah. you see. And so then I was, um, I was a, basically a Jehovah's Witness, pretty active up until about 1990. And then I kind of faded, right. um, faded away for most, most part of a decade. But in those days, fading wasn't such a, a difficult thing as it is now. Because people actually still talk to you, you know, um, and, and now, of course, the instruction from the wondrous governing body is that those that fade should be um, not socialised with. So it's a kind of a, a semi disfellowshipping kind of action yeah. that's taken against them these days. But that wasn't the case um, previously. Well, let's and unpack so, some of that, Mike. Let's unpack some of that experience you had with them, because um, we'll, we'll get on to sort of 1975 um, in, a, in a little while, because it's interesting yeah. you were there at that time, and we'll explain what we mean by that. Yeah. But when you, you got involved with them, and obviously you're, you're going through their, their Bible study material, The Truth That Leads to Eternal Life, and uh, the format there is, is the same as they've, they've always used, really, where you feel you're learning the Bible, and, mm. and if, if, like you, you have no biblical background either, really, to, to measure right. it against, you feel you're learning the Bible. But but now you know you are learning Watchtower Doctrine, as, as I did as well when I spent a short time with them. Mm. But so how did your family react to you sort of becoming a Jehovah's Witness? Um, they weren't very happy mm. about that. I mean, my, I think my mother had had a, um, a conversation with the... Uh, the pastor from the um, the village church, Clayton Parish Church, and he'd come round and they'd had a talk and he, he said to her, um, it, it was the worst thing that I could have done. Right. <laughs> you see, but, um, and so she was very um, antagonistic. My father seemed very indifferent. Um, but the problem, the problem was that um, we then reduced the amount of time that we spent mm. with um, my parents and other relatives, as Jehovah's Witnesses are encouraged to do. Mm. And so that, that didn't go down very well either, you know. And some, sometimes, well, sometimes when, when we went to stay with my mother and father, um, there were arguments. Uh, my mother would be very argumentative and bring things up. Yeah. And um, it got so bad one year, I think one Christmas, um, you know, my, my wife and I at that time, we, 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 we just kind of had to leave early, mm. you know, really. Um, so uh, th there was a bad reaction from the family, really. And did you, did you try to convert your family? Yes, yes, um, but it was very difficult, particularly with my mother, because she's so argumentative, really, and um, she didn't have a lot of Bible uh, knowledge, and so she got very frustrated um, because she couldn't actually really counter the things that we were saying. Yeah. Um, so um, we did. We did try. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, you, you, you become a Jehovah's Witness and uh, you start going to the Kingdom Hall. What, what kind of things happen at a Kingdom Hall? Well, nothing, nothing, nothing unusual um, compared with what happens at Kingdom Halls, generally speaking. You know, there were um, 
uh, a midweek meeting, uh, usually on a on a Thursday, which was for um, really um, training people in the preaching and teaching work. Um, there was uh, a meeting on Sunday um, for like a, a pu- what they call a public talk, we would call a sermon, and then uh, a study of a Watchtower um, magazine and an article in the Watchtower magazine, which was, you, you know, very tedious because mm. obviously you as you probably know you're just as supposed to answer the question from the paragraph mm. you know and if you start putting your own ideas across then very quickly you would not be invited to make any more comments yeah. um, at all and uh, then we had what was called um, um, a book home study that used to be on Tuesday evenings for an hour and that was uh, really studying a, a JW publication, a JW book. Um, but later on, they, um, th- th- they stopped that. I think they didn't like the fact that the home group study was more relaxed mm-hmm. and people were more inclined to say what they really thought about certain mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> Yeah. You know, quite animated conversations used to go along in somebody's house. And it was a group that everybody got to know each other pretty well. Mm. And uh, so you didn't feel threatened if you actually yeah. uh, said something that was a b- bit controversial. Mm. But then the Watchtower, of course, um, I think, um, twigged it. And they then incorporated the home book study as part of the midweek meeting. Mm. Um, so there aren't any home book studies these days. Oh, well, I think I think you're right as well. Uh, they, they certainly discourage independent thinking. Any any situations where you can start to think for yourself, like you said, and express your own opinions, yeah. then uh, then that's frowned upon. Now, yeah. most most people know that um, if they know anything about Jehovah's Witnesses, they know them from the door knocking. Probably everybody's had a Jehovah's Witness on their doorstep. Yeah. What was that like as a Jehovah's Witness to go door knocking? Um, well, initially, it's not so bad because you get trained up. You go with somebody who's more experienced. And I suppose for the first maybe, I don't know, couple of weeks, three weeks, you, you just stand there and, and smile and, and listen. Mm. Um, and then you, um, then you learn to um, prepare an opening kind of what they call little sermon really mm. which was um how how to introduce what you were actually um presenting to them particular magazine you were presenting to them and which, which particular um aspect of the magazine were you going to um uh, focus on as your introduction uh and so you learn you learn to do that mm. and then you learn to um be um more flexible really and um be prepared to um look at other things that were brought up um by by the person you're talking to at at their house and um i I didn't i didn't mind it too much i didn't i didn't mind it too except when you were out and it was absolutely freezing you know (laughs) or or you you chucking it down or something like that um but I, I didn't mind it too much i mean i i can, can i can say i can only think of about three or four times where i really had a very very aggressive mm. kind of reaction you know and uh, often that was to do with the the blood issue mm. uh the, the blood, blood trans- transfusion issue because as you know um jehovah's witnesses uh, forbid um the transfusion of blood yeah um into their bodies yeah so uh, yeah interesting i think yeah there's there's certain things isn't there that that people know that they know that jehovah's witnesses knock on doors they seem to know about blood possibly about the fact you don't celebrate christmas as well as another sort of issue yes, holidays holidays yeah holidays yes yeah. so uh, would you say um 
you ever in- encountered any any real Christians whilst knocking on the doors who shared the gospel y- with yes. you? Yes, 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 I did. And I, I what one um, one that, that lived on the other side of the town here in Loughborough. Um, I was out with a, a, a friend um, who was a Jehovah's Witness called Robert, and we called at a house of a Christian. And he really gave us um, a good, actually, a good evangelical witness. Mm. And um, I remember him because that happened so f- infrequently. Um, so, but it didn't really, the penny didn't really drop. Mm. You know, because because we we were part of the great crowd mm. and not part of the hundred and forty four thousand, and things like being born again mm. um, from a Jehovah's Witness point of view only applies to the hundred and forty four thousand uh, that are in heaven. Um, so um, they gave us a good witness, but because of that, you know, the penny didn't really drop. Mm. But I remember, I remember I got a good witness from uh, um, Brian Schindler, who's uh, in the Hollywell um, Church, and he had um, he had a, a little kind of ministry for twenty years, uh, called uh, in, in the town centre called the um, Sunday Family Fellowship. So Brian is a very very godly man, mm. and he knows his scriptures. Mm. Um, and very very well in fact he once told me when when he was in the shower he recites uh, psalm 139 wow so you know he knows psalm 139 well very good does he make it last the length of his shower is that how well, long he shall yeah, last yeah, yeah 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 well. you can just about uh, get quite a nice shower out out of psalm 139 um, well, that's a good job he doesn't know Psalm 119 yeah. off by heart. He could be in there a long time. But Yeah, but, but on occasion I'd meet a Christian, mm. you know, and they wouldn't really witness to me. I remember one, 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 one woman said to me, oh, well, you people don't um, believe in the deity of Christ. Mm. And then she said, well, goodbye, have a good afternoon, you yeah. know, rather than actually telling me why, yeah. why she believed in the deity of Christ you see but uh, i suppose 90 95 percent of people are kind of uh, indifferent mm. really and not interested yeah i think i think you're right i think you know i've i've done door knocking with the jehovah's witnesses and as a christian and you know apathy is 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 the thing i think you find more than mm. aggression or or even sort of challenge um but for for, for jehovah's witnesses it's it's not optional knocking on doors is it i mean you you know i no, i've tried to, you can't no. be a jehovah's witness and say i'm not doing that well if you did that in fact i, I did that at one stage you know because i just kind of said i don't see that there's any uh, scriptural necessity to to report hours mm. and mm. i said i thought if you you you'll go out there um, out of love for people, out of concern, um, and because you want to do it, not yeah. not not because you know you have to do it, yeah. and you have to report at the end of each month how many hours you put in, how many books you've placed, how mm. many magazines you've placed, mm. how many Bible studies you have, how many um, iPad presentations you've presented or whatever you know mm. I, I, and so I disagreed with it so they weren't very happy with me with that right but um, after six months of doing that you, you you're becoming active in their view yeah. and then you're viewed as spiritually weak mm. and you, people don't associate with you very much mm. and then you don't have any kind of privileges in the congregation as they call them and answering at the watchtower study or you know being used on the microphones yeah. or anything like that so um, what you're saying mike really is that people's sort of love for you and acceptance of you 
in, in, in the Jehovah's Witnesses te seems to be conditional. It is conditional, absolutely conditional. Because what they would say is they, they often want to present themselves as like the most loving people in the world and yeah. we're all united. But yeah. is, that, is that not true, really? It's not true because it is conditional. Yeah. If you start um, questioning anything the governing body has said or printed, or if you start questioning um, the Watchtower's interpretation of certain scriptures, um, then you'll be very rapidly um, kind of hauled into the back room with the elders yeah. and basically told to shut up yeah. um, in effect, you know, and that if you don't, are going to carry on with this, then you'll be viewed as an apostate and be disfellowshipped. Mm. So once the word got, gets around the congregation that you're being a bit critical of this, that and the other, then again, people give you a wide berth, you know, so it is, it is a conditional love. I mean, they're very sincere, they're very kind yeah. people and they look after each other extremely well. Yeah. And uh, particularly when others are in need. Mm. But once you step off um, the watchtower treadmill um, and start thinking independently and start airing views mm -hmm. that are um, in conflict with watchtower doctrine, then, you, you know, you're out in the cold. Now, you've, you've mentioned governing body a couple of times. Could you explain what, what is the governing body? Well, the governing body is a group of eight men. Who um, reside in a luxurious complex that has been built at a, near a town called Warwick in North New York State, next to uh, a beautiful big lake surrounded by lots and lots of trees. And they um, make all the final decisions on watchtower doctrine and practices. Mm. They make the final decision. They say they have various committees underneath them that do the work. They have a writing committee, for instance, and they write uh, the, the articles in the watchtowers and awake and the, any books that are coming out. They have a service committee that oversees um, the uh, worldwide work, preaching work, and um, how that's done and, and uh, the kind of things that they expect to be done. Um, and other, other committees, mm. quite, quite a list of committees. And they all then do this kind of work. But in the end, the governing body are the, are, are the people who are... Um, the ones that uh, veto anything mm. and kind of approve approve of anything, but they are um, self-appointed men. Mm. Self-appointed men. Yeah. And I take it if the governing body is to be increased in size, that that will be a decision of the governing body itself. Uh, that is correct. But obviously we would get information from other fields. And is it the case that the governing body then appoints new members of the governing body? Uh, that is correct. And they, they, they actually um, have, they actually have stated that uh, they are not infallible and they're not um, inspired. Mm. They've stated that in one of their magazines in 2017. And yet they expect every Jehovah's Witness to obey them to the letter.
And if you don't, and you make clear you don't, and you won't repent, as it were, then you will be disfellowshipped. So in, in reality, Mike, what, what, what you're saying is that as much as Jehovah's Witnesses claim that they just follow whatever the Bible teaches, you know, it's, that's all we do. We just we just believe the Bible and follow what the Bible teaches. Uh, you you now know, uh, as I know, that actually it's what the governing body teaches, the Bible teaches. So because the governing body are really the ones that control everything. So. so for example, a Jehovah's Witness could knock on your door, my door today and, and tell us something and say the Bible teaches this, this is what the Bible teaches. But next week, they could come and have changed their view, not because the Bible's changed, but because the governing body have changed something. That's right. That's right. The Bible hasn't changed. But on top of that, they've got their own, own translation. Mm. And so they've changed their own new translation yeah. to prop up their own theology, particularly against the deity of Christ. Now, the original translation in the um, 50s and up to 1960, New World Translation, was not translated by any Bible scholars. Mm. They were translated by five people of only one of them had any kind of um, preliminary uh, training in um, Bible Greek, mm. Fred Franz. And we know this because his nephew, Ray Franz um, wrote a book. He was he was on the governing body from 1971 to 1980, and he was forced off the governing body because he was somebody who was teaching others um, more true Christian um, belief, mm. and he was forced out, and um, he was eventually disfellowshipped um, for having a meal with his boss and his wife um, and him and his wife because this chap had um, disassociated previously mm. uh, but which didn't used to be a problem but in 1981 they decided that you had to treat a dis disassociated person like a disfellowship person so they were to be shunned mm. and so Ray, Ray was having um, a meal and somebody saw them and reported it to the congregation he was down in Alabama I think near there and um, um, he, he was he was disfellowshipped but he wrote this book which was very influential on me called Crisis of Conscience. Mm -hmm. This is the book Crisis of Conscience and this really was his first book he wrote two books this um, really affected me quite strongly. My friend Robert had a copy of it and he was so terrified that his wife might see the copy that he kept it in the boot of his car. Oh wow. Uh, so I'd only read it at lunchtime mm. but he told me about it. I got a copy. I felt so guilty I threw it in the dustbin. Wow. And then I was still curious so I got another copy and read it. And that was really about his life yeah. in the Jehovah's Witnesses, yeah. really. And uh, the, the hypocrisy yeah. and other, other, other things like that. But he wrote a second book called In Search, in Search of Christian Freedom. In Search of Christian Freedom. And this was a more kind of theological book looking at... Um, what you might call orthodox christian beliefs mm. and so i read that and as i was reading that i was also looking to the bible to be checking you see so that was very influential yeah. on me and, uh, and then finally i read read this book captives of a concept by don cameron which was influential in showing me that quite clearly the claim they make to have been appointed by um, God 
uh, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ in 1919 as the only channel of communication between them and mankind was the Watchtower was completely wrong, was completely rubbish. But that set me off on an independent inquiry in, in, into, in, into that, um, that claim. Um, and uh, I, it, 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 that claim is a lie. Yeah. That claim is a lie. I mean, I can prove it. I can prove it's a lie. Um, but in 2013, the governing body decided that they alone Mm. were the faithful and discreet slave in Matthew 24, 45 to 47, and not the whole group of the minority spirit anointing group of Jehovah's Witnesses, which they claimed before, and they claimed that the governing body was just a spokesman for them. In 2013, the eight men became... Um, the uh, faith and discreet slave and they claim that uh, they they were the successors of previous governing body Now, what you're, what you're sharing, Mike, is interesting because what it's what it's showing is that within this group, there's been all kinds of changes throughout its its time. And, and yeah. you know, it's interesting as well that you say the governing body claim that they're not inf infallible, they're not in, they're not inspired. Mm. But yet they, they expect you to believe everything they teach and to follow every, every edicts that they make. Now, you, you were in the Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1970s. Yeah. Now, um, throughout Jehovah's Witness history, they have made um, prophecies yeah. of, of, of when the end would come, when Armageddon might arrive. Yeah. And the big one really was in 1975. Now, now, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses today would say they never said that it was going to be 1975. Now, mm. you were about in those days. Mm. Were they saying 1975 was the end? Um, well, in the UK, it wasn't as strong as in the United States. Interesting. So there were some people that were aware of it, but I don't think um, they were um, they were all that convinced in the congregation I was in. Right. And so I actually got married in 1975. In retrospect, I've studied it in, in, in great depth. And it's very clear that from 1966, um, when the, the book, um, the, uh, the Sons of Everlasting Life or something like that, um, was published, which have this kind of timetable in it, drawn up by Freddie Franz, leading up to um, just 1975. That they um, were expecting, they were expecting Armageddon in 1975. The goal is there, everlasting life, serve with it in view. Do what Jesus Christ said, serve with everlasting view as long as Jehovah asks us. Jesus urged endurance on your part, and then he says, by enduring, you will acquire your soul. As one brother put it, stay alive to 75. And they, there was, an, uh, there was a, 
an Awake article in 1969 that more or less said to young people, look, you know, don't bother to get an education. Mm. Don't bother to get, um, you know, spending time le learning to be an engineer. Because uh, these courses are so long that um, by the time you've graduated, um, the new system will be here. You know, they actually said that in a, in a, in a wake. Um, and in, in other magazines and books, you see, if you look at the truth book, You know, there are a lot of quotes in it, secular quotes about 1975 yes. in the 1968 edition, mm. uh, which um, were heralding doom shortly because there were going to be massive famines and there were going to be this was going to happen and that was going to happen. And these were secular quotes that they put in the truth book. But in actual fact, as we know, nothing happened mm. at all. But people actually sell, sold their homes. And they went on the road in the, the, the caravans or what they call in the United States RV, mm. RVs, the rec rec recreational vehicles. And they, um, uh, cashed in their, their savings, life savings, yeah. and um, they uh, went on the road mm. telling everybody that Armageddon was going to be in 1975 and if, if, if you weren't on board, you're going to be annihilated. And so before 1975, there was a, a, a real surge in growth Mm. Uh, in Jehovah's Witnesses and of course then um, it didn't come and then um, the, in the Watchtower in 1976 they blamed yeah. they blamed the rank and file for yeah. reading more into, into what had been written than uh, they should have done mm. really And it was until until 1981 in a Watchtower magazine in November the 1st, I think, that they actually got round to apologising in a kind of very uh, mean kind of way yeah. for the fact that um, they got it wrong mm. and so many people have been misled. Yeah. Um, and that, but that was a step further, an apology. In 1925, in 1925, um, there, oh, I haven't got it here, but I have a copy. There's a, a Millions Now Living campaign under Judge Rutherford. Mm -hmm. And um, they then said there was going to be the, the new system on the earth in 1925. Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the old uh, prophets were going to be resurrected and of course that was the first campaign mm. that they went on after they claimed in 1919 that they, they were the sole channel of communication from God and yet in 1925 this campaign went down in flames yeah. you know so Mike, uh, but, what, what do you think? Uh, they didn't Mike? apologize for that. R Rutherford didn't apologize for that. No, well, I mean, Mike, it's interesting because obviously you're you're looking at all this information now through different eyes. Yes. Um, but when you're in the organization and you realize that you know that there there's been 
they, they probably won't say they haven't, they won't say they've been lied to. They say that the governing body made a mistake or whatever. How, why do people just keep on believing and carrying on? I mean, what what is it that keeps you going? It's a so it's a social structure, right? It's the fact it's the fact that m most Jehovah's Witnesses have f other family members that are witnesses, mm. and there are a great great number who know, who know that the Watchtower teachings are wrong. And through the internet, you see, the, the governing body are absolutely terrified of the internet. Yeah. And so they more or less direct Jehovah's Witnesses not to look at anything to do with um, religion at all, except their site, the jw.org site, and there are not any what they call apostate sites and so they give them very stern directions um but they do people do look at look at these things and they begin to realize that things are not correct yeah. uh, a lot of things a lot of um absolutely basic fundamental things that uh, major things like the deity of christ yeah. and so um they won't leave because if they do leave and disassociate themselves like I did, then they will be shunned mm. by family members yeah. who are Jehovah's Witnesses. Apart from uh, those that might be living in the same home. So if you disassociate, you know, that uh, your wife mm. at home will still uh, talk to you. <laughs> Um, but it's it, it, she would frown on it. But you see, you lose contact with all your your, your relatives. So I have a, a granddaughter who is five years old that I've never met. Mm. I've never met her at all. I've seen pictures of her. I've actually seen her on a bus with a granny. Um, I got on the same bus. Mm. Um, but I've, I've never met her, and I don't think she knows that I exist. You know, I, I, for a long time, I was in a kind of spiritual wilderness mm. after left the Jehovah's Witnesses. But it was only reading of the, the books I've shown you that began to open things up for me. And um, mm. then I, I, I began to realise, you know, that there were some basic things about being a Christian that I didn't have, yeah. you see, I didn't have Jesus as my mediator mm. and intercessor. Mm. So if I don't have that, if I'm praying in Jesus name, it doesn't matter mm. because those prayers aren't going to be received by God, mm. you see. So uh there was a necessity to be born again mm. and give your life to christ uh, john 3 3 to 8 you, jesus said you must be born again must mm. if you want to get into the kingdom of heaven well we're going around with magazines of jehovah's witnesses on the top of the watchtower saying announcing jehovah's kingdom mm. so every jehovah's witness apart from the, those who claim to be of the anointed 144,000 expect that they will be in the earthly part of Jehovah's kingdom. And yet Jesus said, unless you're born again, yeah. you will not. And yeah. he, he, he emphasizes it. He says, you should not be surprised that I said you must be born again. So yeah. he, he, he just, um, makes makes very clear that this is a necessity um mm. to become a follower of him to have a relationship with him mm. you see so basically um i, I began to realize that i was going to realize that uh, jesus could be prayed to that, that jesus could be worshipped mm. all things that jehovah's witnesses don't believe really and that uh, um, the Trinity is true, um, that um, the Holy Spirit is a person, not a force. So lots of things, really. Yeah, lots, lots, and th lots of things, isn't there? That's, 
that's so different between the yeah. Jehovah's Witnesses and biblical Christianity. Yeah, and absolutely. Yet these guys claim that they are Bible-believing Christians, and 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 I mean, when you were with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Would you say you ever had any assurance of, of God's love or, or salvation as you understood it? How? No, not really. Not really. Because you see, um, at the end of the day, um, if you got through Armageddon, okay, and you got into the millennium mm. reign of Christ, of course, as you know, at the end of the millennium, Revelation tells us Satan is actually let loose. Mm. So, you never had an assurance. Yeah. You never knew whether you were going to get through the test at the end end of the millennium at yeah. all. So there was nothing like we've got that once we give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have a guarantee of eternal life. Yeah. And our eternal life starts at that point. Yeah. You know, and death is just a transition of one form of the life through to another form of that life you see but they they don't have that they don't no, i think that. i think that was that was sort of my big thing as well that i i went from feeling that i i knew about this god but i didn't know him and and yeah no assurance because I, depending on how good a, a jehovah's witness you'd been that particular week that day <laughs> that hour it, it was it was up and down you know if, if you'd been out and done lots of, um, of publishing work and uh, and we're able to fill in like you, you say the the time sheet and and how many magazines placed and everything yeah you felt a, a, a maybe a little degree of security in that moment because you'd done your bit yes well, but then if you if you a, had a bad day you you thought yeah. well if i'm beginning comes now i'm lost there's yeah. no, it was soap and down and yeah but you see they don't believe in faith no. and grace mm. you see for salvation and not works paul yeah. says in ephesians 2 quite clearly you know the works aren't going to save you this yeah. is a gift of mm. faith and grace that yeah. you've been given but that you have been then made for good works yeah. do good works but the works themselves are, aren't the things that save you yeah. but they you see believe you know that they will get salvation through the works that they've done. Yeah, that, that's right. It's, it's very works-based. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So you, you obviously came out, out of the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, read literature like Ray Franz and, and other things, and came to a saving faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's that's well, I, ha, I ha, had I had done that, yes. Yeah. Now, I mean, it, it's hard, isn't it? I think for people coming out of groups like Jehovah's Witnesses to quickly adopt Christianity, biblical Christianity, because it's drummed into you that it's Christendom and it's false religion. It's part of Satan's empire of false religion. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And so. Well, what, what... What happened with me, what happened with me was um, I'd been thinking about the the uh, annual memorial me meal that uh, Jehovah's have each year to um, remember the death of Jesus Christ. And it's a one, their, their most important meeting of the year. And I was walking downtown um, outside the bank and there were a couple of JWs there. And I just started talking to these girls mm. and it was about a week or two weeks before the memorial meeting. And I started talking to them about the fact that this was a very serious business. If you're not partaking of the bread and the wine, mm. because Jesus had commanded, uh, as Paul recorded in 1 Corinthians 11, that to do this in remembrance of him mm. and yet not to do it then you were denying christ really and he said also didn't he in john 6 that um his flesh and blood were life and they were eternal life and that if you didn't eat of his flesh and blood 
he would not be able to raise you at the last day. Mm. So they're missing out on, on resurrection yeah. as well, yeah. as well as disobeying this command. Yeah. Um, and so I, I talked to him a little bit about that. And then I forgot about it and the memorial came and went. And then on July the 2nd, in, this was uh, 2014, I got a, about 11 o'clock, I got a knock on my door. Um, and there were two elders from my um, congregation. And they were saying, oh, we understand that you've got um, some doubts about the, uh, you know, the memorial and the bread and the wine. And you have some doubts about the governing body. Because I've been in um, email correspondence with a, um, an elder in another congregation showing him my research about the 1919 claim. And um, clearly um, showing that I had no reason to believe that claim at all, that uh, the governing body were God's channel of communication to mankind. Mm. And I, I didn't get into really um, discussing all this exactly why. All I did was actually give them a witness as to what I come, be come to believe. Mm. You know, that I come to believe in the deity of God, that I come to believe um, that um, you had to be um, born again. Um, and, and, and all other things that I talked about earlier, really. Mm. And I gave them a witness um, and that you had to come to Jesus and surrender your life to Jesus, mm. you see. And I gave them a witness and they went away and said, oh, we'll come back in a week's time and see if you still uh, believe what you've told mm. us. So I went into the house and I went into the kitchen and the whole thing was, well, what are you going to do now? It's not, not where you're going to go. Mm. It's to who you're going to go. And so I gave my life to Christ mm. there and then. And so the first question, well, the first thing that came into my mind was a little, a little, um, little hymn we used to sing in the in in the Clay, Clayton um, church when I was in the choir there before I went to Oxford, mm. and it's it's from one of the Psalms I think, and it's we used to sing sing it in the, the vestry before we went into the the the, the main um, church aisle, and it it it, it said, um, "Lead me, Lord, lead me in your righteousness." Make now my main name plain before my face, for it is thou, Lord, thou, Lord only, mm. who makest me dwell in security. And that was the first thing that came into my mind. Yeah. And the next question to, the first question to the Lord was, well, where do I go, Lord? Mm. Where do I fellowship? I've no idea. Mm. You know, Methodist, Baptist. Evangelicals, Pentecostals, whoever, where, where on earth do I go? No idea. Well, as it happened, uh, and, all, and all these things don't happen by chance, as we know. Um, I live next door to two Christians, literally next door to two Christians, um, Phil and Helen Griffin. And I knew that they at one time had been going to the local Thorpe Acre Anglican Church. Um, Thorpe Acre is just an area on the edge of Loughborough. And I, I, I was talking, talking with Helen and we're Leicester City supporters. And we were talking about Leicester City. And um, I, I just said to them, are you still going to that church across the road? And they said, no. And they said, um, well, um, we're going to another church called Hollywell. And I said, oh, well, why did you, why did you um, change? And they said, well, because Hollywell was a much better Bible-based church. And uh, so I, I said, oh, good. Well, 
Um, and they were delighted because I said to them, I've become a Christian, you see, mm. and they're absolutely delighted. And uh, so I said, well, next time you go, can I go with you? And so next time they went, they took me along. Mm. And I'd, in between time, I'd gone on, on to the Hollywell website and listened to uh, our pastor, Joseph Pettit, preach, I think, from John about John 13 or 14 and I thought it was very good and so I um, went with them and then I you know joined the church and I um, got baptized there and then became a member and uh, all, all this really was out of my control you know from actually talking to those two girls to actually going to Hollywell and becoming part of that church and coming to Christ, you know, was all out of my control, really. Yeah. Wow. That's fantastic, isn't it? How, you know, God brought you out. That's God's plan. Absolutely. Next door to two Christians who, who sort yeah. of led you into the church. Yeah. Now, yeah. it's been a fascinating um, story and, and testimony, Mike. And I wonder, as we, as we just draw it to a close now, I wonder whether you could give any advice to any Christians listening uh, to, to what they might, might say to the next Jehovah's Witnesses that, that they meet on the doorstep yeah. when yeah. we come out of lockdown, of course. To, well, to help them, yeah. Well, they'll be out again eventually. Yeah. I think, really, um, there's, there's off to the problem. The first thing is, if they come at your door and it's very inconvenient, you know, you just got out the shower or you're just getting in the car to go shopping. Mm. Say, yes, I would like to talk to you about things in the Bible and um, make an appointment, which is more convenient. Mm. Um, and they'll come back. Now, if you have time, then talk with them. Mm. But I think the main issue and their great um, Achilles heel is the deity of Christ. Mm. OK, so you need to concentrate on the deity of Christ and put together, um, put together scriptures that um, support the deity of Christ. Mm. Now, obviously, I haven't time you know, to, 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 to tell you and do those things, but I do have a, a website mm. which is called Michael North. And on that is a... Um, PowerPoint presentation entitled Sharing the Christian Gospel with Jehovah's Witnesses. And anybody can look at that and go through that. And it's really um, an outline for the PowerPoint presentation that I've done in a few local churches around this area um, to help Christians witness to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. Um, the second thing is to show Jesus is also God. Mm. The third thing is to show them that they need Jesus as a mediator. Mm. They must have, you know, 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 5, they must have Jesus as their mediator. And the fourth thing is that um, to enter the kingdom of heaven, mm. they must be born again. And the fifth thing I would say is that Jehovah's Witnesses must realise that to disobey taking the bread and wine mm. is in fact denying Christ and denying their hope of a resurrection, yeah, really. But the, the number one is the deity of Christ. Well, Mike, I think that's really, really helpful information. And, and I'm sure when we, we, we put this out on YouTube, we can put a link to your website yeah. um, that people can access. Uh, I mean, because on, on the back of this, obviously, we, we want people to engage Jehovah's Witnesses to see people, do. people as lost people who yes. need Christ, who are lost without him. And uh, everything you've shared um, is something we, we can do. We, we as Christians, we can talk to them about Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. We need to we need to focus on Jesus really, and yeah. not get sidetracked yeah. onto any of these other things like holidays, yeah. blood transfusions, 
Absolutely. And all these other, other, other minor things, really. Um, you focus on Jesus centrally is important, really, because um, there's only salvation through him, Absolutely. really. And they must understand that and they must realise that they need a, a personal relationship with Jesus Christ Absolutely. that they don't have, yeah. really. No, you're absolutely right. And they're, they're very keen to talk to us on these these sort of minor issues or to deflect us when we're getting somewhere. Yeah. They'll, yeah. they'll bring something in. But you're right. Jesus is the focus. Well, you've got, him alone. The thing you've got to do, Tony, is take control yes. of the conversation. They will come and they want to talk about something else. Yeah. They want to talk about, well, you know, is uh, the coronavirus they are part of uh, the signs of the end? Of the of, of the age um, or something like that the spread of this disease is distressing to be sure but we're really not uh, surprised to see the world in the grip of such pestilence are we Jesus made it clear at Luke 21 11 that pestilence would be part of the sign of the last days and in Revelation chapter 6, the ride of the fourth horseman includes mention of deadly plague. So the events unfolding around us are making clearer than ever that we're living in the final part of the last days, undoubtedly the final part of the final part of the last days, shortly before the last day of the last days but you've got to take control yeah. and deflect onto jesus deity really yeah. uh, do it you know as peter as peter advises kindly and with respect um but be firm about it that's the thing be firm about it um but obviously uh, it's a lot easier if um you have time in between maybe a first call coming and they coming again because you, then you've got time to prepare yeah. really what 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 you're going to say to them yeah. but i encourage anybody to uh, just look at um the um powerpoint presentation on my uh, youtube channel which yeah. as i said is under michael north yeah. and they will get a good idea of uh, the kind of things they can talk about you know even you know talking about the holy spirit um and and other things really and pro proving proving you know just proving from revelation you know that jesus uh is god really mike thank you so much for sharing your story with us and your wisdom on on reaching out to jehovah's witnesses and praise god um that you find yourself in jesus today and secure assured of salvation and uh, as, as only Jesus can can offer us as our mediator as you pointed out and, and I just pray that people watching this will find it useful in, in uh, giving hope and, and bringing the gospel to Jehovah's Witnesses so thank you so much my pleasure my pleasure